I think there's a big opportunity for creatives to not just think about how do we connect the arts sector with the health sector, but how are creatives the fundamental necessary component of changing what people, what society have accepted as the definition of health, period. Welcome to Voices of the Community, where we dive deep into the heart of Northern California, exploring the issues that matter most. This episode is part of our second season shining a spotlight on the vibrant and resilient arts and culture scene, a driving force in our community's identity and well-being. Our second season features highlights from the second annual California Arts and Culture Summit, organized by our partner, California for the Arts. This year's theme, Artwork is Real Work, underscores the vital role artists play in our economy and well-being, despite often lacking the support they need. We'll hear from leading voices on topics like arts and health, economic justice, climate change, youth engagement, and more, all with a focus on the public policies needed to support our creative industries. Nafisha Ezreal from California for the Arts introduces our second episode, featuring a panel discussion on arts and health, led by Deborah Cullinan, Vice President for the Arts at Stanford University. Discover how art can serve as healthcare with insights from Chris Appleton, founder and CEO of Art Pharmacy, Dr. Tasha Golden, director of research at John Hopkins International Art and Mind Lab, and Dr. Andre Viscontes, a cognitive neuroscientist and opera stage director. Tune in to learn how creativity can transform well-being and take action to integrate the arts into your life. Thank you to the beautiful trailblazer, Nataki Garrett. Let's give it up one more time. The arts truly have the power to heal and bring us wholeness and really, you know, take care for our entire well-being. And as we dive into this next conversation, we're going to dive deeper into the powerful use of the arts as we discuss arts and health. This arts and health panel will be moderated by Deborah Cullinan, Vice President for the Arts at Stanford University. Make sure you get your notepads ready. I'm sure you're going to have a ton of takeaway from this panel discussion, and the panelists will introduce themselves also. Thank you. So glad to be here. It is so wonderful still and always to be in person, isn't it? Just so great. And yay, state of California. Here we are. Thank you so much to Julie and the incredible team at Californians for the Arts. This is such a beautiful thing, and they do it so well. We're really glad to be here. So this morning, we're going to talk about art and health. And we're specifically going to dive in on social prescribing or art on prescription. I'm going to give my, you know, I have the experts here who will help me make this better. But just to frame that, social prescribing is really a practice that probably has existed for a very long time and we know has been very successful in Europe, where healthcare providers can prescribe non-clinical, non-pharmaceutical options like the arts. Yes. And arts on prescription is about being those healthcare providers being able to prescribe things like art and nature and other things that we know are good for us. So this is really a conversation about the systems and structures in our lives. It's a conversation about that the fact that we know that participation in art and creativity early and often and always is good for us in all kinds of ways, and we have the evidence to support that. And so because of that, our jobs are to integrate the arts into the systems and structures that make up our lives. And here we're going to talk specifically about how we're doing that as it relates to art and health. So I'm going to have our panelists introduce themselves. And while they're doing that, I would love to just hear you each talk about why you are doing this art and health work and maybe specifically, particularly for Chris and Tasha, why social prescribing. And let's start down there with Chris. Hello. It's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. I'm Chris Appleton. I'm the founder and CEO at Art Pharmacy. And Art Pharmacy is a social prescribing company. We work with health plans, cultural organizations, teaching artists, healthcare providers, school-based mental health counselors to get people access to the kind of care that we know works 
which is arts engagements. My entry point into this work really was began with pulling on a thread of asking a question, why has our U.S. healthcare system not adopted arts and culture into care models at scale if it is bedrock science that arts engagement can improve health outcomes? And that question uh, about three years ago is really what ultimately led me into this work. Tasha. Yeah. Hello. Doing this work was not the plan for me. I started out as a singer songwriter. I thought that's, you know, that's the work I dreamt of doing since I was a little girl. I thought I'd be doing that till I died. <laughs> but noticed some things with music that, you know, people share things with me after concerts that they had never told anybody else before, like drawing on the songs that, you know, address issues like mental illness or domestic violence or things like that. And I started to think about, you know, what is it about a music venue or about a singer or a song that makes people's stories of their lives speakable for the first time? And what does that mean for all of the spaces in our lives that are vital to us, whether that's our workplaces, our clinics, our homes, where we cannot speak those stories? How do we bridge the gap between what's possible in the space of the arts and what's not yet possible in these other spaces of our lives? And I, I founded a, pro a program called Project Uncaged. It's a creative writing program for incarcerated girls and saw the same thing there, that young people, no surprise to any of you all, share really different things in their poems and songs than they ever share on questionnaires or surveys or even in conversations. So again, this looming question came up for me of like, what do we not know about so many populations and experiences in our lives? Because we are not paying attention to the ways people need to express those experiences or pursue them or bear witness to them or process them, right? And how is that lack of knowledge affecting the resources and services and, and types of care that we're able to provide to people? So I kind of pulled on the thread of that question through a PhD in public health and specializing now in the impacts of the arts on our health and well-being writ large. That includes, you know, the impacts of the arts on our data and our knowledge, but also on our physiology, on our psychology. And I get to direct research for the International Arts and Mind Lab at Johns Hopkins and work with the University of Florida Center for Arts and Medicine and get to talk with really amazing people like you all. So glad to be here. I'm Indre Viscontis, and I grew up in Canada as a child of immigrants. And my family very much valued the arts, but that was not how you made money. And so both my brother and I, we had to have DR in front of our names before our parents would let us go off into the world. So I got a doctor in philosophy, that cheekily. He's an orthopedic surgeon, so my mom will be fine. <laughs> but I, did, I chose neuroscience because I wanted to learn more about how our brain learns and remembers and how we form our identity because I thought it would make me a better opera singer. Because after all, on stage, you're taking on all of these characters, and if you knew how their mind worked, couldn't you then be a better performer? So in my valedictory speech after getting my PhD, I announced to the class that I was leaving science and running off to be an opera singer. <laughs> so I went and got a master's in music here at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. And there I started to see how big the disconnect was between what neuroscientists know about the brain and learning and memory and performance and what the pedagogues, how they were teaching the next generation of musicians in particular, there was such an emphasis on, a perf on performance and such an ignorance about practice, even though that's what we spend the majority of our time doing. So I developed this course called Training the Musical Brain, using neuroscience to develop more effective practice strategies. And I taught it for many years, and it was very, very popular amongst the musicians. And that's when I realized, huh, I can serve as this bridge between this neuroscience world and this artistic world in a way that most people can't. So I launched a career in science communication and then fast forward to the pandemic when I got tapped by the Sound Health Network, which is an initiative of the National Endowment for the Arts and UCSF in partnership with the National Institutes of Health, the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, and Renee Fleming, who's a really wonderful advocate for music and medicine. And they tapped me to be their director of communications because I had been serving as this bridge. 
And this initiative, this network was designed to address the problem of siloed organizations that are interested in this field and to really figure out how can we promote the impact of music on our health and well-being in terms of also uplifting the research, finding more funding for the research, making the research better, and then getting that information out to the public. And then that, so over the course of the last four years, we've seen an explosion in interest in this area of arts and health and music and medicine. And so I've just taken on the role as the chair of the scientific advisory board for the NeuroArts Blueprint, which is an initiative that was started by Susan McSalmon and Ruth Katz. So Susan McSalmon wrote Your Brain on Art, which if you haven't bought it, you should. It's great. And so we, it, together with, this, with the NeuroArts Blueprint, we're working to really lay this foundation of research to really understand how the arts can impact our, our health and well-being. Do you see what I mean? This is an incredible panel. <laughs> So there are a couple threads here, and I, I feel like I'm guessing that a lot of people in this room are aware of the research that we're referring to, and maybe would like to hear a little bit about specific, more specifics about what is the evidence, why this work, why arts on prescription, why are we trying to integrate the arts into the way we think about health, but maybe if you can move from like specifics around how you've applied research in order to advance things so that everyone here can do their own social prescribing program when they go home. Chris, we can start. Oh, um, well, we, um, uh, you know, as we know, the science is clear. Engaging with the arts improves health outcomes. And the way that we incorporate that science at art pharmacy is through technology. When doctors write prescriptions for participation in arts and culture engagement for their patients and then call that prescription into art pharmacy, our technology takes that unique member profile or patient profile based on clinical needs, social needs, access barriers, preferences around arts and culture, that person's identity, and then matches the the patient to arts and culture activities in their community with protective and therapeutic benefits to their mental health. And it's a, it's a system that one of the things that I think works really well about social prescribing or arts and prescription, perhaps in a way that's slightly different than antidepressants or other pharmacological interventions, which are certainly necessary for many people, but is that there's a feedback loop that's much quicker Right, so you go to the, you go to your psychiatrist or your doctor, and you're depressed, and you get a prescription for Prozac or Wellbutrin, and then they say, "Okay, come back in six months and let me know how it's working." Well, a lot of things happen in six months, especially if it's not working. And arts engagement provides a quicker feedback loop so that we can learn. Oh, you know, participating in those dance activities was actually really good for me, or you know, I need to do something that's more receptive and being in the audience or witnessing somebody else's performance or production. And that's, you know, one of the many ways that I think that the practical applicability of the arts to our health um, makes sense. It's great. And we'll get a little bit, drill down a little bit deeper into the collaboration that we have underway at Stanford in a few minutes. But Tasha, so research and, you know, I think about the field guide quite a bit and sort of specific examples of how research has actually helped someone get a program like this piloted or launched. Yeah, there's what's interesting about the evidence behind arts impacts on health is that that's almost never the barrier to a program like arts on prescription. A lot of people assume that it is. And so they hit me up for like, what's the evidence? But the reason that we made this field guide and you all can get it for free, there's a big TashaGolden.com slash field guide is the one that I always remember because it's my website. <laughs> but you can go get it for free there. I hope that you will. But we created this field guide because we wanted people to know how to set up these programs. And what's, what we had found is that the barrier to setting up the program was usually infrastructure for it or know-how for it or funding for it. It was almost never. I think I could say never. I think that you've said the same thing. I don't, I've never come across a provider who was like, that sounds, I don't know about that art stuff. I don't, I don't necessarily want to prescribe that literally never met a provider who was skeptical about using this in their practice at all. 
So, but what the evidence does is make it more possible for to move some of the structures and the systems that need to be in place for people to be able to actually access an arts-based program, to have it paid for so that they can have access financially to it, to have access as far as transportation and things like that. So the field guide goes through a lot of ideas for how you can set up those systems, but also provides a little bit of the evidence base that might make somebody pay a little bit more attention. Or <laughs> this is this is my bias, y'all, but I think that you, in the U.S., we don't really, at the structural level, make decisions based on evidence. We, we want to believe that we do. Can you say that again? At the structural level, we don't make decisions based on evidence. If we did, we would have universal health care. We'd have universal basic income. We wouldn't have mass incarceration. There are a lot of things that we know go against the ev- like clear evidence of what's good for people, right? So I think a lot of times the way that people use evidence in practice, just to be really practical about it, is that they use it to help justify something that they already want to do or to help maybe move the needle on, you know, maybe it helps, it can help persuade people for sure. There are people who are open to persuasion. But I think a lot of times what we see in this particular work is a need to set up systems and structures and funding to make it actually possible so that those people in positions of power can say, yeah, not only do I agree that that could be good for people, but I see a way to do it. Thank you for, you know, thank you for illuminating it. Yeah, that's really great. Well, so we're going to come back to a couple of those themes. Do you want to speak to the I, research? I, and yeah. I do. So I'm going to be a little bit contrarian and say that I don't think the research is all there yet. I think there's so much more that we need to and can learn. And I think that, you know, when I think when people talk about music, I feel like I'll, I use the analogy of a sledgehammer. People say, oh, music is great. It, it involves your whole brain and all this. And that's just not true. Music is a Swiss army knife. It's a precision tool. It does not work the same way for every person or in the same situation. And day to day, you can listen to the same song today and be moved to tears. And tomorrow it can make you rage. So it is not, it is not, I think there's so much more to learn. And, you know, I'm, I just became the president of the Society for the Neuroscience of Creativity, right? Sounds really awesome. We're 10 years old as a society. And 10 years ago, if I had told a tenure committee that I was studying creativity as a neuroscientist, I would not have gotten tenure. I would have been laughed out of the department. And now we have a society and we have, and it's growing, but it, it's in its infancy. It's, we're babies in terms of the research space. And so I guess I, and I think, you know, to Nataki's point, part of the problem is that because the artists haven't been centered in the research enough, So I would just put the plug up to you and say, you know, we as scientists, we need to hear from the artists about what you think are the outcomes that we should be measuring, what you think is the impact of the work that you do. Because a lot of times we're just shooting in the dark and we need your insights. You know it's all effective. You know it all works. But sometimes the powers that be don't yet. And certainly the researchers are trying to help move us that forward, but we need participation from the artists themselves in order to really make meaningful research happen. Yeah, I think this is a really good point. And in fact, I think you're kind of in agreement in a way that this idea that we don't necessarily have to bring a pile of evidence in order to sway, say, some people at Stanford University that art in the lives of our students, for example, is a good idea, right? Right. We don't necessarily need to do that. Um, What we need is the infrastructure and the systems and the people. We need the people who buy in. And what I think we find is that people are on a kind of spectrum. There are the people that really know it, can speak to the data, understand the impact. There are the people that get it somewhere here, maybe somewhere here, but not fully. And there are the people that are skeptical, right? Like, and this is, this is a long game of continuing to gather the evidence and tell the story of the impact of art in people's lives. And so no matter what we do, we have to continue, I think, gathering that evidence and telling that story until it is just a part of the way we think. And that's that takes a long time. Something that I want to go back to that Tasha brought up too that's really interesting is just this idea that you don't have to necessarily convince people, and in part, and Chris, you can speak to this a little with regard to our project, I know what we found with Culture Rx in Massachusetts, just sort of as a side note, was that the healthcare providers expressed a feeling of relief or joy in being able to prescribe something other than medication. 
right? And at Stanford, I'm going to have Chris explain our project a little bit more, but we knew that it would be hard at first to get student engagement because they are so busy. We also thought it would be hard to get referring partners. And we wanted to have about six referring partners, so six different units on campus that could refer students to Art Pharmacy's Care Navigator in order to prescribe them doses of art. And what we have now in the first two and a half, three months is 40. 40 units on Stanford's campus with people who are making those referrals. And many of them came to us. Many of them said, I want that. And I do feel like it's it just indicates to all of us that people know that the traditions we're using right now to support people fully and wholly are not enough and they're siloed. And people want to be able to meet the full person, help engage the full person. They may be a computer scientist in their studies, but they're an artist or they are, you know, interested in the arts and it's our job to make sure it's whole in a way. So Chris, tell us a little bit about how the program is working. I think that last word that you use, whole, is important, that there's been a movement over the last decade or so to really think about whole health. And prior to that, and certainly still true, we think about mental health disorders and many, many diseases as biopsychosocial diseases. And the U.S. healthcare system, you know, our care infrastructure is really built to address the bio and psycho components of care and not the social component of care. And that's where really where social prescribing can come in, whether it's arts prescription or food prescription or nature prescription or, you know, other forms of other forms of social care. At Stanford, you know, we started talking, goodness, about a year and a half ago about a partnership in the wake of some challenges of, on college campuses related to time to care between the time a student raises their hand and says, I need help, I have a mental health concern, and the availability of a provider on campus to provide that care. This is a, this is a challenge on college campuses. It's even more so a challenge within Medicaid and Medicare uh, members. And, and lo and behold, you know, artists and arts organizations and the resources on the Stanford campus are, the cultural resources on the Stanford campus are just waiting in the wings to help address that time to care, that sort of capacity issue. And so at Stanford, the, the way the program works is that with Vaden Health Services, with the athletic department, with student mental health deans, with really anyone, you know, administrator, faculty member, healthcare provider on campus that is, that is engaging with a student's mental health and well-being, writes a prescription for nine doses of arts and culture. And then they call that prescription in to our pharmacy and the student connects with a care navigator, which is a, a traditional social prescribing model is called a link worker. And it's a human being that really gets to know you and understand what the student's, you know, particular needs and interests are and has a really good understanding of what the cultural resources, the arts resources there on campus. And then they help make a match and they help remind you and they help to address barriers that may exist. And, you know, um, you know, as you can imagine, like working at Stanford, barriers are different than working with teenagers in Georgia, which is where we're headquartered, that are on Medicaid, right? And the challenges at Stanford are that students are so busy and they're so driven and they're so performance focused that maybe they don't take time for their mental health and well-being. It's not a cost issue. Many of the resources at Stanford are already available to the, to the students. And so social prescribing really, as Tasha spoke to, helps to get at the underlying barriers to access and participation, sometimes which are cost and transportation. Other times it's permission. When a faculty member or somebody that's, that is in administration at Stanford is saying, hey, maybe instead of going and studying on Saturday afternoon, you ought to go to a pottery workshop. Permission to take care of yourself. Welcome back to Voices of the Community, where we delve into critical issues facing Northern California communities. 
Voices of the Community is made possible by generous support from the Zellerbach Family Foundation, dedicated to ensuring vibrant work is created, new voices celebrated, and diverse communities have opportunities to thrive. Learn more at zff.org. We're also supported by the Peaceful World Foundation, fostering a culture of global peace through hosted conversations and education. Discover more at PeacefulWorldFoundation.org. Before we return to the panel discussion on arts and health, enjoy our one-on-one interview with Chris Appleton, founder and CEO of Art Pharmacy. He speaks with our co-host Eduardo Robles about the transformative power of artists and cultural workers in healthcare. Stay tuned to learn how art can heal and inspire change in your community. Hi, I'm Eduardo Robles with Californians for the Arts and Voices of the Community here with Chris Appleton at the California Arts and Culture Summit, just got out of the Arts and Health panel. And we have Chris Appleton here for some insightful points of view on the panel he he just came out of. And just a little question, I mean, a question around your program at Stanford, maybe just elaborate a little further on on on, you know, what you're doing there. Great. So Art Pharmacy, we are based in Atlanta, Georgia, but work nationally, and we're partnered with Stanford University to provide a social prescribing or arts on prescription program there at Stanford. We talked a bit about it on the panel, but to share more, we're really trying to address on campus getting access, students getting access to culturally relevant, culturally accessible, timely mental health resources. And the arts are readily available to do that. And so the way our model works is that prescribing partners on campus, which are at student health services or other other departments on campus, prescribing partners write prescriptions for arts and culture. The typical prescription is nine doses of arts and culture. And the student gets that and it's called in, the prescription's called in to art pharmacy. And art pharmacy is really kind of the infrastructure and, you know, plumbing that makes it all work. And after that, you know, student is referred to art pharmacy using our technology and then also a care navigator. The student gets connected to arts and culture resources with protective and therapeutic benefits to their mental health. Oh, that's very interesting. I just saw a post right now about librarians being labeled kind of like caregivers or that there's space and they're healers. And then I saw another librarian kind of like step in and say that they're not professionally kind of trained to be healers. And how about artists? Where do you see kind of like this credentialing of art workers as kind of healthcare workers? How how do we legitimize them in, you know, in, in, in systems, funding structures, in the healthcare system? So there are a couple of ways to think about that. So one, certainly say that artists have been healers since the beginning of humankind. There's nothing new about the idea that artists are helping to improve people's health and well-being as well as prevent disease. There's nothing new about that. The science is very clear. And again, artists have been doing this forever. I think there's, you know, maybe two ways to, to, to get to your question about the credentialing or certification of artists and cultural workers as healthcare workers. You know, on one end of the spectrum, you have sort of population health or public health programs where people, the public simply gets access to the arts and culture resources in their community through a health plan, an insurance company, through a health system, through a public health program. That's, that's, That's one end of the spectrum where we're not asking our theaters and community dance studios and art centers and museums necessarily to do anything differently than they're already doing. And that's important. They're already doing this work, right? And, and, and artists can keep doing that work. And whether we call artists healthcare workers or not, they're healthcare workers, right? The other end of the spectrum is that patients or individuals are referred to very specific arts and culture activities or resources where the provider of that resource has been trained, certified. They go through quality, you know, 
quality protocols to 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 make sure that they remain up to um, up to date in their in their trainings and certifications. And so it's not an either or; it's certainly a both. And in order to advance both of those goals, that artists are truly recognized by the U.S. healthcare system as healers through certifications and credentials, as well as for cultural organizations to be embraced by the healthcare system, we need to continue to invest in demonstrating the evidence and outcomes that moves the needle for our healthcare partners. Yeah. And I guess it's like that. How do we get to clarifying that story? You know, like, how, you know, which are the artists, you know, doing this work or the type of discipline, the type of partnership model so that it's more clear to you know the legislators you know how are you seeing that kind of emerge in you know your your program like who are which art pr- practitioners which culture but like how are they stepping up to 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 kind of art yeah we think a lot about you know i get asked a question a lot of you know what what's the most helpful art form or what type of arts activity is the most beneficial to to somebody's health or is most effective in our model and and you know the the way to answer that question is to acknowledge that different art is beneficial for different people just like if we take it to pharmaceuticals some people with anxiety disorder may respond well to one anxiety medication and some people, you know, another person would respond well um, to a different anxiety medication or cancer medication or, you know, whatever it may be. Right. And so the, the arts are not a one size fits all. We do know studies show, you know, the, the study that I, I cite the most often is a Longitudinal study by Dr. Daisy Fancourt out of University College London. I think it was published 2020, just a couple of years ago, that said sustained ongoing engagement in arts and culture, regardless of what the arts activity is, reduces isolation and loneliness, boosts connection and belonging, and then patient well being. And so, if we know that as sort of baseline, that just ongoing sustained engagement in the arts is good for people's health, then After that, we can really get smarter about matching sort of the right arts activity, right? The right medicine to the right patient place at the right time. I guess, lastly, what what are like the blockers, you know, like what are the blockers to legislation? What are, I guess, decision makers unseen when, you know, you have all of this evidence, all these outcomes? What is what 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 are they blocking, or what are, what are how are they articulating, not moving forward with some of these? Oh, there's so many reasons that wonderful science-driven resources don't make their way into policy priorities. I would say is maybe the you know at the top of the list. There's only. You know, there's only so many things that um, that policymakers and and more broadly regulators can can prioritize at one time. And so, I think louder voices, more consistent voices, more concise voices from the cultural sector, but also from the the sort of whole health movement. You know, there there was a recent sort of regulatory action. In New York State, um, it's a waiver. It's called the 1115 waiver. It's a waiver between New York State Medicaid and the Centers for U.S. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services that essentially authorized New York State to spend billions and billions of dollars addressing health-related social needs. And in that waiver, it states that that those health related social needs could include things like housing or transportation or food which are essential social needs that we have social determinants of health but it does not include social connection and belonging and that's a place where the arts are really powerful and we know is 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 advancing social connection and belonging and so a lot of times it's not just in sort of that we need new policy it's that within the existing policy that we have, we need to be smarter about the way that that policy is implemented. 
Thank you so much, Chris. These are great, you know, ideas that, you know, we're going to share with, you know, the, 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 our, you know, our arts advocates out in, you know, California. And thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Up next, enjoy a captivating interview with Dr. Tasha Golden, Director of Research at John Hopkins International Arts and Mind Lab. Tasha sits down with our co-host Eduardo Robles to share her groundbreaking vision on redefining health and the elements of a person's life and community that brings them a sense of well-being to help them thrive. Stay tuned to discover how creativity can transform well-being and inspire change. Don't miss this insightful conversation that could change how you think about health. Hi, my name is Eduardo Robles with Californians for the Arts and Voices of the Community here at the second annual California Arts and Culture Summit. We just got out of the arts and health panel, and I have one of our panelists, Dr. Tasha Golden. Hi, Tasha. Hi, good to be here. How are you doing? We just wanted to, you know, just kind of get some key takeaways from the panel you just were a part of. And, you know, before you kind of go into, you know, some some takeaways from your from the panelists, I really wanted to you to kind of elaborate more on like the this vision of kind of redefining health Mm -hmm. in society that 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 was very powerful when you mentioned you know the possibilities with all of these projects you know that are being kind of advanced and Mm -hmm. uh, kind of like a a key moment in terms of how art is being utilized in government so dream yeah (laughs) dream in your in 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 how you how you're thinking about yeah Well, I think a lot of times people th- think about arts and health and they think about combining sectors, like we're going to combine the arts sector with the health sector. And that is obviously a really great place to start. That's where we have to start now because those are the sectors that exist. But, you know, a larger way to think about it is to redefine health itself. So, you know, I mentioned on the panel that the World Health Organization defines health as complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And if we actually carried that definition through, we would have to make sure that we have, we're able to supply people with opportunities to be well. And it turns out, like, you know, I get to ask people all over the world, like, what is well-being? And, you know, the the answers are really diverse, but they cohere around a, a number of like things like, you know, making, you know, having meaning, having purpose, being connected with people, having supports when you need it, when things go wrong, having being able to pursue curiosities, having like a meaningful occupation of your time, a sense of contributing to something larger than yourself, being able to experience beauty and creativity. These are the kind of things that people say that well-being is. So if we decided as a culture as a society to embrace the actual definition of health, like the real one that we established, the WHO established in 1946, then we would have to think about how are we set up, whether that's, you know, or whether we continue to call that our healthcare system or whether we just call it, you know, our communities and our society, we would have to set up a way for people to find that meaning, to find that purpose, to connect with other people, to pursue things that are meaningful to them. All of those things that I just mentioned as far as definitions of well-being, we would have to figure out how to supply those. And those things, as it turns out, fall under the umbrella not of healthcare, but of arts and culture. And so the reason that that definition matters for me is that instead of thinking about how do we you know, convince the healthcare sector that they need the arts or like tie these two sectors together, it's more like how do we redefine what health is so that it becomes incredibly apparent intuitively that these aspects of our, of our community are aspects of our ability to thrive and that thriving is an essential part of being healthy. It's not just a nice to have. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking us on that, you know, envisioning. Can you elaborate a little bit more on your role in this movement for arts and prescription? Who are the players who were like the initial kind of stakeholders that, mm-hmm. you know, you became a part of? You spoke a little bit about cross-sector partnerships about how to sustain those partnerships? How did you keep the, the the train running for this this project, Arts and Prescription? Mm. There's the w- initial way that I got involved most recently was because Mass Cultural Council, the State Arts Council for Massachusetts, launched the first statewide Arts and Prescription program in the U.S. in 2020. And they invited me to evaluate that program. So we did a lot of really interesting evaluation because these these partnerships across the state were really different from one another. So you might have, you know, in one part of the state, a local theater attached, you know, not attached to, but partnered with some clinics, a system of clinics. And then on the other in the other part of the state, you might have, you know, a physical therapy 
clinic partnered with a dance studio for individuals with Parkinson's disease. So they were all really different from each other, which meant that when we did the evaluation process, we got to learn a, a lot, about a lot of different kinds of partnerships and how they worked differently from one another, what worked, what didn't work. And we did see a lot of challenges, like with turnover. If, if the person who was championing a kind of program at a clinic then took a different job, then then that might become difficult for the arts program to 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 figure out, okay, who's going to be the next point of contact at that clinic so we can continue, continue this partnership and the other way around. So in our write-up from that evaluation, which is free, anybody can get it, I encourage you to do so, we shared a lot of what we learned as far as what was really working and what were barriers. And what was really working was that people really did love these experiences and, and took advantage of them. The prescribers themselves, the you know whether they were pediatricians or physical therapists or mental health therapists, they appreciated being able to refer people to these kind of experiences and they use them in lots of different ways. One of the physicians told us that it felt like prescribing beauty and it brought her joy to be able to share these experiences with patients and clients. And so anyway, once we had done that evaluation and learned so much, Mass Cultural Council was like, how can we share what we've learned with other communities in the U.S. so that they don't have to start from scratch? We did so much trial and error with this brand new program. How can we share that? So they brought me on to create a field guide and we, you know, used what we learned from Mass Cultural Council, but also a whole bunch of pilot studies across the, the country, including the new, the new program at Stanford University, which is represented in the field guide. And people should get that field guide because it is a massive groundbreaking resource and it is totally free. You can get it at TashaGolden.com slash field guide. But like learn a lot about what arts and prescription is, but also we kind of take you step by step through how you can implement it in your own community. And what's so exciting right now is that we're seeing, you know, whole mu municipalities or whole universities think about how they can pilot this kind of program. But we also still see, just as we did in Massachusetts, maybe a single arts program partnering with a single, you know, clinic or a single mental health therapist. And it can start that way. You can, you know, you can plant these seeds as far as what might be useful to what population and what kind of addressing what kind of condition or need. And you can start small and build from there. Thank you so much, Tasha, for taking the time to, to speak with us. Yeah, thank you so much. Let's return to our panel on arts and health, led by Deborah Cullinan, Vice President for the Arts at Stanford University, along with Chris Appleton of Art Pharmacy, Dr. Tasha Golden of John Hopkins, and Dr. Andre Viscontis, a cognitive neuroscientist and ARPA stage director, on how art can revolutionize healthcare. Stay tuned and learn how to integrate the arts into your life for better well-being. Yeah, and, and one of the things to me that's also quite notable is a lot of this for young people is, is related to isolation, just feeling isolated. And, you know, we have heard that among the barriers for a student at Stanford is also just, I don't want to go alone. And, and so just rethinking the whole thing, like, why, why would you have to go alone? Why we'll get you two tickets. You know, that's part of what this is, is to ease it and shift it. And so we'll, we'll get more into that, but Tasha, from, from the field guide, I'm curious about the same kind of idea. Like what specifics can you share here about how people are making this work? And, and I should also add that at Stanford, part of the reason that Chris and I wanted to do this was certainly for the, for the campus, not only for our students, but we have big aims on this program being student, staff, and faculty. But we'd also like to demonstrate this in a way that can then be shared beyond Stanford in other systems in the state of California and beyond. So just to point that out. but Yeah, I think it's important to just emphasize that this kind of program is necessarily local and creative and collaborative, that you know, as much as we might want to scale the concept of arts and prescription or social prescribing, it's more that the, it's more that the concept is scalable versus a specific program. Because as you can imagine, in any given community, the program that, you know, the things that somebody might be prescribed or referred to is going to depend on what's in that community, right? Like what kind of art is available? What kinds of experiences might you be able to go out and have? So at Stanford, like what, what are the arts and culture resources here? That's going to inevitably necessarily look different than, you know, the arts and culture resources on a different campus. So what I love about working with creatives in this kind of work is that it, the creativity is not just the arts experience that somebody might have. It's the experience of putting together the program itself, which is inherently a creative process and inherently a very collaborative and partnered process across different sectors. So 
in the field guide, to your point, there are like, I think there are six different stories of how this has looked in different places. So from Culture RX in Massachusetts, which is the first statewide arts and prescription program that Massachusetts uh, launched in 2020. And we evaluated that program that kind of spawned the field guide. And then there are all kinds of other programs described in there from Stanford's program to, you know, a program for older adults based in New York to programs for veterans. And not only do they look different for the population sometimes that they serve, but they look different as far as like, what are people being referred to? What are the kinds of responses that they're, you know, that they're illuminating once they have had that experience? And yeah, I think that, uh, and to Indre's point as well, like the evidence that it has to be personalized and it has to be hyper local. There has to be an openness to consider like, what is in this community? How is that a rich resource for for the individuals that we're serving. And then, of course, if there is something that people need and that's not available in the community, then that's also another creative opportunity to be like, what what is the arts or culture or nature resource or all kinds of other social resources that people need that isn't here yet? And how art, how can artists be a part of creating those things as well? So speaking to permission, not that any of us need it or any of you all need it, but the permission is also to develop programs that reflect your community, that reflect cultures, that reflect the work that that you're doing and the work, especially, and the field guy really emphasizes this, the, the work that people say that they want. What is it that students are saying they want to be able to experience? What is it that the ultimate community users of an experience are saying that they want and need and desire to experience? And how can we provide that to them and then assess that and make sure that you know, on an ongoing basis, we're making sure that that is doing the work that, you know, we hoped that it was going to do when we when we launched it, right? And, and if yeah. I can just say, what it also does is it takes health and wellness dollars and puts them back into the pockets of the local communities, artists, teaching artists, cultural organizations. Um, you know, artwork is real work, right? So if artists have been healers, since the beginning of humankind, and we know that that is true, then they should be paid to be healers. And can I just yeah. make one comment too? So one of the things that has come out of the Society for the Neuroscience of Creativity was that you know a few years ago we had a our annual meeting and we had an NSF grant to bring in some educators to come and see because we're like, look, we're doing all this great work in the lab about how to foster creativity. We want to get it out to the teachers so they can utilize it in the classroom. And, you know, we had a great time, lots of great conversations. And then at the happy hour, one of the educators came to us and said, look, this is all really great, but it's never going to happen. And we were just like, why? And he was like, because my parents and my community wants their kids to go to college. And until creativity is a prerequisite to get into college, we're not going to have the time or the funding to emphasize it the way we are all the other things that lead to better scores on the SAT. So you know what we did? We started working with college application essays, and we have a major project now across eight different institutions, 42,000 college essays that we have run through our expert raters and a number of large language models to score them for their creativity. And it turns out that these creativity scores are almost as predictive of future GPA as the SAT, and they're 15 times less discriminatory than the SAT. And it gets better. This year, one major Ivy League university is actually using this tool now in their current admissions cycle. So now, 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 we can go back to the teachers and say, you know what, actually, creativity is going to get your kids into college. We've solved that problem for you. Now put the music programs, put the creativity programs back into high school because you can tell the parents solidly that that's what's going to get their kids into college. Fantastic. So fantastic. So, you know, this, this goes to, again, the idea that we're never done gathering the evidence, telling the story, doing the research, right? And that it, that it can help shift culture and shift policy and that's such important work. And we're going to come back to, I think, this really important point about how you think about gathering, doing the research or gathering that evidence in whatever way you can, and then how you apply that to the work of culture shift that leads to laying the groundwork for policy change. And by that, I mean small P or big P policy, like how do we shift things? And what you just described is really exciting. Now we have to make that shift happen everywhere, right? So we'll come back to that, but 
Before we do, you know, Tasha, you raised the importance of designing arts on prescription programs and other programs with really thoughtfully as it relates to diversity and equity and inclusion and really thinking about who people are, what matters to them, and how this it can be relevant to their own lives and their own cultures and traditions. So that leads me to a question for you and Chris about design. How do you think about what are the ethical challenges in designing these programs and how do we help everyone be thinking about how to include, be very inclusive in program design? So we'll start with you, Tasha. Well, I, this is, is maybe not the way that I would have planned to answer, but the first thing that pops into my mind is that the a big ethical challenge is that you whitewash a broken, biased, racist system, right? And this comes up with, you all know, like arts organizations and arts programs. You know, I've worked with Project Encaged in carceral facilities and a big ethical issue to deal with is to what extent does the presence of this arts program in this facility whitewash the injustice of that facility's existence in some cases, right? And the U.S. healthcare system is also, you know, studies show it's full of bias and racism and his- historically and right now. And so I think a big issue to deal with right at the very beginning is understanding going into that partnership. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't have that partnership, but it means that you go in with your eyes open. And that also means you go in with eyes open about the way that the arts sector has also been exclusionary and racist historically and now. And how do we reckon with that at the very beginning so that we can help, you know, across sectors help one another to not perpetuate those things, but to become solutions for one another, for how we increase access, for how we increase equity. So that's the first ethical consideration. And the second one, which is probably more obvious, is that we ensure that the work that we are setting up is not just feeding our own interests. So as much as I might love music, for example, that's what I'm rooted in. If that's what I'm if I assume because of my love of songwriting that what every community needs is a songwriting class, that's, that's a, you know, that's going to be an inequitable approach. It's also not going to be effective. And so we have to make sure that as much as we might have a passion for a specific kind of art or a specific kind of program that we're letting what leads the work is our interest in people's well-being. And that means that the people who are going to be most affected by or served by a program are always at the center of leading it. You know, the disability rights community gave us that phrase, nothing about us without us, right? And that has to be true for these kinds of projects and programs as well. Goodness, where to start? The U.S. healthcare system is is a very broken system that is the system we have. And I think it is radical in and of itself to to think that Medicare and Medicaid and United Healthcare and Kaiser Permanente will pay artists to be healers, but that is not enough. When designing, one things that I would one thing that I would encourage people to consider if if you're pursuing a, a arts on prescription program in your community is is to broaden the definition of what is included in that network of arts and culture activities, both for the the artists and healers in that community and also for the patients or participants or members that would participate. Something that is so important to us at Art Pharmacy when we go to a you know new community and, and set up a program, we try to build as, as big and broad of a network as possible but it, it would not be possible for us to know everything that was there or every need that that an individual has. So as a as a patient engages with our care navigators and they say, well, I actually want to be able to go to the community center down the road. If that's not in our network, our work to do is to go bring that partner into our network and really meet that individual where they are. So yeah, I, I think that you know building in the U.S. healthcare sw- system is full of of dilemmas mm-hmm. and trade offs, um, um, but uh, surrounding uh, surrounding you know advisory councils and and programs with um, people who have lived experience uh, in the design is essential. Thank you so much. Thank you all for that. So uh, it, all three of you 
are doing the work of reaching across sector and across expertise in order to share this information, this data, this evidence that we have in order to shift systems. So talk a little bit about what that's been like. <laughs> like, what are, the, what are the challenges? What are the surprises? What's been useful to you? You're sitting, you know, at, at Stanford at Vaden Mental Health Services trying to convince therapists that this is a good idea, or you're, you know, trying to communicate across the universities to be thinking differently about how we how we think about creativity, you know, all of the work that you do, Tasha, can you, can you just help us understand what, what roadblocks have you experienced? What's been surprising and what's been helpful? And we'll start with you, Indri. Okay. So yeah, it's hard. Uh, I think, I think what we, what I've seen happen over and over again is that you get people in a room from different disciplines and at first it's really exciting and everyone is talking, talking, talking and finding all these collaborations and thinking about things to do, and then you go away and nothing gets done. And I think that's been the challenge is to figure out what are the kinds of projects that we can do together and have our own roles and still be true to, you know, our own disciplines. And then how do we, you know, what is the pace at which we meet again and again? What are the ways in which we meet can it be virtual? Does it have to be in person? How do we work together to, to put these projects on? And all I can say is that I don't know the answer yet, except that, you know, we need to keep trying. And I think that we try in these different ways. And, and what I've seen to be probably the most successful is when there is a project that has a, a specific goal in mind that everyone is working towards, and then they can bring their own thing. So whether that's putting together a proposal for a grant or something related to advocacy or policy or training or, you know, certification or, or developing a new intervention, there has to be a kind of very specific goal and deadlines and outcomes to get there. Otherwise, everybody's busy and it's going to go on the back burner and then nothing happens. I would say similarly, we, we've seen both at the uh, International Arts and Mind Lab and then like other work that I've been engaged with that the, the partnership across sectors is just difficult. And I think if you can know that going into it, then, you know, to Andre's point, you don't have a situation where everybody's gathered together and because nobody's prepared for how challenging it might actually be to do something rather than just talking. If that hasn't been part of the conversation, if there's not an awareness, uh, you know, from the beginning and then a framework, we, we created, a, you know, a few frameworks and some partnership helps and step-by-step -step processes to help people through this. Because if you're not prepared for that, then you're kind of like hoping, I guess, <laughs> for like a kind of magical collaboration to happen. And when that doesn't, when that doesn't inevitably work out, then it's kind of like, oh, I guess this wasn't meant to be, or I guess we can't do this when really it might've just been as practical as needing to learn some foundational frameworks for, you know, what does it take to work across sectors? What does it take to partner with somebody whose background or, or industry standards are really different than yours? So I think that's a barrier, but it's also a really, it's also a really cool opportunity. And if I can also just share what gives me hope is I think a lot of this work with arts and health is more than I see it as combining two sectors. I see it as completely redefining what we think health and well-being even are. You know, WHO defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Complete mental, physical, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. That's the WHO's definition of health from like 1946. And in our society, our, the ways that we approach health, even if you pull out your phone and look up health emojis, they're all the absence of disease things. They're all medicalized. They're all that part. So there, I think there's a big opportunity for creatives to not just think about how do we connect the arts sector with the health sector, but how are creatives the fundamental necessary component of changing what people, what society have accepted as the definition of health, period. Because if we recognize that health has to include the opportunity to be well, and in my workshop today, we'll talk about like what, what the heck does that even mean? What is well-being? Once you accept that that's a fundamental, inherent part of what health even is, you have to get out of clinics. You have to get outside of 
pharmaceuticals, right? Because what is it that gives people a sense of meaning and purpose and connection? Or like I'm always saying, what is it that allows somebody to have a life in a world that they want to participate in? That's health, right? To wake up in the morning and want to be here, that's part of health. And what provides that? Sometimes it's medication. As somebody who's been on medication, I can say it saved my life, so no shade on that. But it's a lot more than that, right? And if we could change society's understanding of what health is inherently, that's where we begin the kind of revolutionary work. It's not just tying one sector to another. It's overhauling what we think health is and who we think creates it. Do you want to add to that? I, to speak to the challenge, a challenges question, you know, it's like failure every day. Uh, and success is every day too, but you know, it's, it's, it's very, very hard to do this work. And one of the, one of my takeaways from doing this for the last couple of years is that, you know, I think that people within arts and culture organizations that many people within arts organizations, I'm sure most of the people in this room do a lot of thinking and are very committed to doing their level best to deliver program services for the participants in your program and really thinking about the needs of that individual. And we have to do that. I think that when these arts on prescription programs and related programs get built cross sector with other partners, with health systems, with doctors, with schools, we don't put the same level of care and consideration and time and thoughtfulness into designing something that is just as successful for that doctor or that health plan as it is for the participant. And if we want to build partnerships that are lasting and sustainable, it has to work for everyone. We have to provide, we have to provide consideration and care for all stakeholders in the scheme. And that's really hard when you don't come out of healthcare and understand what all the needs may be of a doctor or of a insurance company. That's where failure comes every day is going into meetings and, and not understanding all the needs that they have. But in the same way that we try to ask as many questions as appropriate of the patients and participants in our program, we also need to ask those same questions of the other partners and stakeholders in our program. Great, great. So I, I'm getting the signal that we're running out of time. Do we have time for a question or two? Okay. So this is going to be rapid. Just shout out a question. Just shout it out. Seriously. So for somebody who has come from the healthcare industry and has worked with that have been Bruce on the ad side, when there are prioritizing bottom lines mm. over how to the point of being going to uh, risk loss, being human lives lost. How can you both satisfy the and be a provider? So the question is about, thank you for that question. The question is about, I'm just trying to make it quick, is about bottom line and how to balance not only the financial bottom line, but all of the other decisions that healthcare providers have to make in order to save lives. I'll speak from my experience. I, I refuse to believe that what is good for patients can't also be good for the health plan's bottom line. I think if you take the long view, the two are aligned. A great example is a program, Silver Sneakers, which you may be familiar with. You know, No one in this room can remember a time where we did not associate our health outcomes to our physical activity level. Like it sounds silly to say that our health is not connected to our physical activity level, but it was just 32 years ago that a company Silver Sneakers emerged and they said, you know, if we could get older adults to go to Zumba classes at the local YMCA, we could improve their health and probably prevent emergency department visits. That turned out to be true. And now every single person on a Medicare plan in the United States has access to Silver Sneakers or now a, a competitor to it paid by Medicare. Right. The two are, if you take the long view, the, the two are not in conflict with another. It's, it's short term, I think, where the challenge is. Great. Well, in the interest of time, what I think I'd like to just wrap up because in a way, each of you 
kind of answered the question that I wanted to end with, which is what, what is the future? What is the future that we want and what does it look like? And I, you know, I think Tasha, you summed it up so beautifully that the future we strive for through social prescribing, through the work that you're doing and have described, through the systems and structures that make up our communities and our lives is a future where we are creative, we are healthy, and we want to be here. So thank you for your good work. They'll be around. I know Tasha is doing a workshop also. So track them down, ask them lots of questions, and thank you for this morning. That's a wrap for our second episode featuring highlights from California Arts and Culture Summit. We heard from our two co-hosts, Nafisha Ezreal and Eduardo Robles from California for the Arts, Chris Appleton of Art Pharmacy, Dr. Tasha Golden of John Hopkins, and Dr. Andre Viscontis about how the arts are being integrated into our healthcare ecosystem. Stay inspired and explore how you can integrate the arts into your life for better health. Join us next time for more insights from the second annual California Arts and Culture Summit's panel on achieving economic justice through community placekeeping. Want to support their work? Head over to VoicesOfTheCommunity.com and click on Where Art Meets Impact and then Episode 2, The Arts and Health Panel. While you're there, explore our website for more in-depth interviews and stories from the Arts and Culture series, sign up for our newsletter to stay connected, and then take the next step to donate or volunteer to uplift our arts community and ensure its continued vibrancy. Today's episode was made possible through our co-production partnership with California for the Arts at their second annual California Arts and Culture Summit. Special thanks to our technical crew, audio and video wizard, Eric Estrada, and our production partner, Bayvac Media, and their team, Paula Argoni, Andy Konami, Javon Giles, and Clay Go. Thanks to Casey Nance from Citron Studios for the graphics magic. A special thanks to our broadcast partners who help share these important conversations. KSFP LPFM in San Francisco, KPCA LPFM in Petaluma, Petaluma Community Public Access TV, and Bayvac Media's SF Commons Public Access TV. Thank you for your commitment to amplifying diverse voices and perspectives. Please support these partners and our mission by tuning in and spreading the word. Voices of the Community is made possible by generous support from the Zellerbach Family Foundation, dedicated to ensuring vibrant work is created, new voices celebrated, and diverse communities have opportunities to thrive. Learn more at zff.org. We're also supported by the Peaceful World Foundation, fostering a culture of global peace through hosted conversations and education. Discover more at peacefulworldfoundation.org. And we love your support to continue to make shows just like this one. Go to georgecoster.com and click on the donate button. Take Voices of the Community with you on the go. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Enjoying the show? Please rate and review us. It helps more people discover these important stories. Watch past and future episodes on YouTube by searching for Geo Coster. Have feedback or ideas? We'd love to hear from you. Email george at georgecoster.com. I'm George Coster from San Francisco. On behalf of our team, thank you for joining us. Until next time, remember, your voice matters. Your voice matters.